Hi everybody, I hope that you're all doing really well. So today I am back to do the first video in a series that I've been long wanting to make and that is a video where I run through a few books that are all to do with the history of sex and sexuality. I've mentioned before that during my undergrad at university my absolute favourite favourite module that I did was on this topic and in it we were tracking particularly western society's attitudes towards sex and sexuality whether that was sexual practice, attitudes to sex and marriage, sex work, sexual violence, all those kind of things and I just found it so incredibly fascinating and it's something that in the past couple of years or so I've been getting back into and there have been some really fantastic books published recently on this topic so basically I wanted to in each video talk through three books per video which deal with a different facet of the history of sex. The three that I'm going to talk about today are these and it's a very pink and yellow affair. In today's video I'm going to be talking about A Curious History of Sex by Kate Lister, The Covent Garden Ladies by Hallie Rubenhold, and then finally Strange Antics, A History of Seduction by Clement Knox. Three books that I have recently read on this topic. And yeah I'm really really hoping that you enjoy this video and that you're looking forward to seeing this as a series. It's definitely a topic that I am very very curious about and I want to learn even more. So first off we have A Curious History of Sex by Kate Lister. This was originally published by Unbound in 2020. You might actually know the name Kate Lister because she runs the Whores of Your Twitter account, which <laughs> I think is a top name. And this is a book that really does what it says on the tin. It is about all different topics, facets to do with the history of sex, whether that is sex and terminology, the history of virginity testing, sex and sexuality as it pertains to race and class, impotency, sex and food, how sex has changed with the rise in technology, sex work, sexual hygiene, like there's so many different topics that are covered in here. It is super, super fascinating. As we all know, I'm a very, very big fan of an integrated image in my history books and there are plenty of images throughout this book. I think what is really really notable about this compared to other histories of sex that you might read is that Kate Lister has this very accessible, very colloquial style of writing but it's still academic. She's got a very dry sense of humour which definitely comes through here. She does like to make pop culture references which I feel like some people are gonna like and others will not. I'm personally pepper all of my speaking with references so I personally really enjoyed it. Obviously there are so many different things that are being discussed in here and I feel like for every single chapter you could read an entire book on that. Obviously this is only going to provide you a bit of an overview. It's not going to be super super in depth but I think what is in here is so incredibly fascinating. It really makes you want to read more and like I say it's just told in such an engaging way that I just think this is the perfect introduction to the topic of the history of sex and sexuality. It's really thoroughly researched and yeah I, I just don't have enough good things to say about this. Next up I want to talk about The Covent Garden Ladies by Hallie Rubenhold. You'll probably know the name Hallie Rubenhold because she was the author of the very popular book The Five and I feel like they've definitely tried to mimic that cover here. I picked this up because I generally thought this was going to be a history of the sex workers who worked in Covent Garden during the 18th century and it is but it's not. What this is more is a triple biography of three prominent figures within the trade. Samuel, Derek, Jack Harris and Charlotte Hayes whose lives kind of converged together with the creation of Harris's List which was an infamous list that was published every year detailing the different ladies of the night of Covent Garden. This book basically details the lives of these three people and they're very interesting however controversial and not always pleasant lives. And I say unpleasant particularly referring to their own behaviours and business practices. Because as fascinating as these characters are, as compelling as they can be, you can find a lot to admire in them but also there is plenty to deplore them for because they were not very nice people. Particularly in their methods of acquiring new ladies to become sex workers. Which definitely included coercion, abduction, rape, all in the name of getting their bottom line. Whether or not you like this book is going to be very dependent on whether or not you find these three figures compelling. Like I say I was wanting to read this because I wanted to learn more about the women that they employed, not really the pimp and the madam themselves. I think the most interesting chapter of this therefore is the list chapter which is spread over about 60 pages or so and gives you a little bit of insight into what you could read on Harris's list including entries such as Nancy V, Charles Street, Westminster. A woman somewhat turned of 40, motherly and careful and very fit for grown gentlemen to amuse themselves with. I mean gentlemen who are old. I mean gentlemen who have been old, are grown young again, and come under the birch rod. 
She flays, they say, with an amazing grace. This is all we know of her. She's seldom coming abroad till the bat and night birds appear. She thinks she is like a certain right honourable courtesan, and she therefore keeps her name. She is called Basket from a former innkeeper, and that's from 1761. Some unpleasant ones, such as Paul Forrester, Bow Street. The very opposite of her namesake, being disagreeable, ugly, and ill-behaved. She has an entrance to the palace of pleasure as wide as a church door, <laughs> and a breath worse than a Welsh bagpipe. She drinks like a fish, eats like a horse, and swears like like a trooper, an errant drab. That's from, again, 1761. Or perchance you might be interested in Miss Adams at Mrs. Freeland's Bow Street Covent Garden, which at the top has the quote, a filthy conquest only you might boast. Come forward, thou dear drowsy gin-drinking, snuff-taking Miss Adams. What in the name of wonder could influence you to leave a profession in which you was bred, for one which you do not appear to have the least pretensions? I must stone, I cannot say what hidden charms you may possess. Don't you think those arms and hands of yours had better stick to their original callings, cleaning of grates, scrubbing of floors and picking a house neat and clean, than drinking arrack punch, getting drunk and setting up for a fine lady? But soft, we are finding fault with the wrong person. Tis your admirers who are to blame. They are so blind as to not distinguish between the girl of beauty and merit and a drunken snuffy drab, who is generally to propose a question or give an answer. This one goes on for a while and then ends. Miss Adams is rather under middle size, fair hair, grey eyes, tolerable good skin, pockmarked a little and may easily be known by the quantity of scotch snuff she takes, particularly when she is in liquor, when her upper lip is pretty well covered with it and does not badly resemble a pair of whiskers. Her breath from drinking has acquired a very disagreeable smell. How her friend reconciles this we cannot say, he must certainly have no nose for it. Well, a toad's as good for a sow as a pancake and that is from 1773. Like I say, those are the most interesting part of this book, and I did find myself wishing we could learn more about these women. I wanted more of the women and less of the business side, personally, but perhaps the reason that we don't know much about them is because literally the list is all we have of them. I also just generally found, as I found previously with Hallie Rubenhold's work, her writing style to be a little bit dry and not very engaging. I always feel like the topics she is covering are really interesting, and that's what kind of sustains me. That's why I go back to them, but I don't really enjoy her writing itself, which sounds really mean to say, but eh, I have to speak the truth. I would definitely be interested in picking up another book on this topic, but like I say, I want to see more of the women who are actually affected, the women who are actually working in Covent Garden. I want to hear more of their voices. I forgot to say that Covent Garden Ladies was a reprint. It was originally published in 2005, but this was a reprint from 2020 from Black Swan. And then finally, we have Strange Antics, A History of Seduction by Clement Knox. Strange Antics was published by William Collins, also in 2020. And I know I always say it, but like, let's have a moment for this cover. How gorgeous is that? I feel like half the reason I ended up picking this up is because it's just stunning. <laughs> Actually, the reason I picked this up was because Leanne Rose was also talking about how stunning this cover was and how interested she was in the topic and she wanted to read it. And so I was like, okay, it's my birthday. I'm taking it home with me. <laughs> in this book, Clement Knox is really tracking our relationship to the concept of seduction. He starts the book in the late 18th century, which he considers to be the time of the first sexual revolution, and then carries through to the present day, focusing on different case studies, which are in some way linked to seduction. And not always in ways that you expect. For example, we spend a lot of time talking about Samuel Richardson, who was the author of Pamela and Clarissa, who maybe was not a seducer himself, but wrote stories about seduction and how his books shaped the public consciousness and opinions of seduction. We also look at the life of Mary Wollstonecraft and Mary Shelley and their relationships. We look at the life of Casanova. We look at the trial of Caroline Norton. We also jump across the pond and talk about Jack Johnson, who was the first black heavyweight champion of the world, but who ended up being hounded by the press, particularly after he seduced a white woman, AKA had the goal to have a relationship with a white woman and how he was depicted in the media as a sexual predator for this. And I feel like all of these case studies in themselves are really, really interesting but once again we've got a book where its author does not quite match the stories that he is telling. I didn't find his writing to be particularly engaging and I felt like everything was very loosely connected. It felt more as if Clement Knox just wanted to talk about all of these different figures, wanted to cram it all into a book and then was like hmm how do I connect these together? And then was like I guess we can call it seduction? Put it all under the umbrella of seduction? Okay, jobs are good in, done my job. And I don't know, I felt like it was a little bit choppy and sometimes a bit disjointed. I found myself compelled to pick up this book, not really because of the writing, but because I already knew a lot about these figures, particularly Mary Wollstonecraft and Mary Shelley. And so my knowledge and interest in those figures kept me going rather than being pulled by the book itself. And I wouldn't necessarily mark this as a good place to go if you don't know anything about these figures and wanted to know more about their lives. 
lives. I feel like with this book you'd maybe find yourself wading through a lot of information that you didn't need. I definitely felt like this book could have been a lot shorter. I was also kind of confused by the conclusion to this book where he kind of tries to tie up all of this history of seduction by relating to modern day issues. You can instantly think of things like Me Too and how our attitudes of sexual assault have changed over time and seeing how that pertains to the idea of seduction. But one of the things he really tried to link in with this was the idea of seduction and the incel community online. And he really tries to drive home this idea of seduction and the incel community and these men in their failed attempts at seduction. And I'm just like, where did this come from? We weren't leading to this at all. It just feels like it was really randomly slapped on at the end. So yeah, I feel like this is a book that is tackling some interesting topics, interesting themes, very, very interesting case studies that he's looking at. But I felt like the book itself didn't tie these all together very nicely, at least from my perspective. So yes, those are the three books that I wanted to talk to you about today that kind of tackle this topic of the history of sex. In terms of star ratings, I would kind of say both of these two around about a three star, definitely like have interesting topics in them, but I wasn't absolutely in love with them. A Curious History of Sex, I absolutely love. This is one of my favourite books of the year, definite five stars from me. In terms of other books on this topic that I'm really interested to delve into, I do have a few on my TBR and one that I have already read, so that will give you a little bit of a taster of what's to come in this series. One that I have read previously a couple of years ago and really really enjoyed was The Origins of Sex, A History of the First Sexual Revolution by Farrow Dabo. Other books that I haven't read but are on my TBR include Queer City, Gay London from the Romans to the Present Day by Peter Ackroyd. I feel like it'd be really interesting to take this topic but looking at it through a queer lens. Another Halle Rubenhold book I have is The Scandalous Lady W, an 18th century tale of sex, scandal and divorce. So here we'd be looking at a case study. I have here a biography of Anne Lister, Gentleman Jack, Regency landowner, seducer and secret diarist, a biography of Anne Lister by Angela Steedell. Once again another case study and one that is particularly important to me because it is a figure from my hometown. So you know, local pride. A more general history of sex that I have is Sex and Sexuality in Stuart Britain by Andrea Zuvic. And I'm really interested in this because as I've said in the past, I'm not a massive fan of the 17th century, the Stuarts don't really do it for me. But maybe if I interrogate that period through this kind of lens, I might find myself intrigued. And then finally I have Sex Lives of the Kings and Queens of England, which is one that I just randomly found. I don't know how good it's gonna be, but... I don't know, it could be very interesting. <laughs> and we know that I'm a big fan of my history of kings and queens. Do let me know if any other recommendations that you have for books on this topic. I think I might even make a Goodreads list of all different books on this subject. If I do end up doing that, I will link that down below. So if you have any suggestions, do let me know in the comment section and I can add to that over time. I'd love to hear from you. I hope you're having a fantastic, fantastic day and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks, bye.